Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne again. I'm taking a look at uh, the different theoretical perspectives uh, that inform language development. Um, this is one of the videos that I put together for my language and literacy courses. Um, by all means, feel free to listen if you're listening in, but for the most part, this is for students that are in my classes. Um, but once again, if you're interested in reading and writing and language and literacy development, um, by all means, hang out for a little bit. Um, and so in this second week or third week of this course, one of the first things that I really start to dig into is the different theories and perspectives behind language and literacy development. I think this is important because as we enter the classroom, we often have concerns about um, thinking about our pedagogy and critiquing uh, our own pedagogy and the pedagogy of others. Um, and I think that if we rely on our own experience or theory, then we can think critically about our pedagogy. Um, it's not just whether or not it looks good or feels good, but we have to think about our own experience and, and what we see with students and what works and doesn't work with students. But then also, is this informed by theory? Um, and, and there's a reason why we have theory, and there's a lot of rigor behind educational theory. And so, I think it's important that we, we consider theory um, behind everything that we do as we get started. So this slide, uh, I mean this slide deck, is going to talk about language acquisition and the, the various contexts and settings that impact language and literacy development. Um, my background, uh, my, my degree is in educational psychology, so I view a lot of learning and I, I view the framing of, of learning, especially language development and literacy, through the lens of ed psych. So please keep that in mind. There are numerous ways to view language development. Mine is primarily looking at educational psychology um, and the role of the brain and a lot of sociology mixed into that. Um, so please keep that in mind as, as we go through this. And I'm saying that because when I teach ed psych classes, one of the things that I come back to again and again is the fact that a lot of, um, that there are a lot of context and contingencies that impact um, and either help or, uh, you know, impair a student's ability to learn, an individual's ability to learn. And so that's what my basic whole course about Ed Psych is framed up on, um, is understanding those contexts and contingencies and, and figuring out how this impacts teaching and learning. And the understanding that just because words come out of your mouth doesn't mean that kids are actually learning. So... In this this week, in this slide deck, um, what I do is I sort of unpack a little bit um, what is involved and what those different elements are as they relate to language development. So a lot of what we're going to talk about as we begin is what is the role of the brain in all of this. As we be, as we start this, the brain's role is is um, uh, very connected to this activity. So one of the mindsets that we have or one of the thoughts that we have is that the brain appears to be pre-wired for language. That is, you know, you come into this world and you have sort of like a roadmap already set up in your head as to what it means to be a literate individual. Um, there's also an understanding that language development occurs as parts of your brain or regions of the brain mature. Um, and that's pretty easy to understand. That's easy to make sense of. As you mature, as you develop, your brain also develops and it matures. And you can, you know, it, as you uh, cognitively develop, so too you will develop language skills and language competencies. That makes sense. Then we also think about the role of social interaction in development. Um, and this is a critical element. This is something that I'll come back to again and again in this slide deck and also uh, in the next series. But we want to think about the role of social interaction as we are engaging and learning and trying to develop these language and literacy competencies. As we think about the role of the brain in this, there's a lot of different component parts. Um, these are vocab elements, uh, vocab words that many of us have seen in other classes or other areas. Um, but it's important to know the role of these different elements and how these different components and parts and pieces plug into language development. Um, and like I said, this is a lot of stuff that comes from um, brain science. This comes from our human growth or ed psych classes. But it's I think it's important to understand um, 
what these different components do and, and what they do as we develop. So when I think about language development, I like to go to the most basic element. And what I'm looking at is the synapses and the little uh, neurotransmitters or those little electrical, electrical currents that are jumping the synapse in our brain. So if you think about it, your brain is forming thought. You have an idea, you have one area of your brain that forms thoughts and the, the, tra the currents start to, to, you know, jump across that synapse. Um, and, and those currents, those, those little electrical storms get bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger, and we form thought. And at some point, you, you sort of lump these thoughts together and, and you try to figure out a way or you decide that you are going to communicate these thoughts to other people. And that communication may be through written, it may th be through verbal, um, it could be through dance, it could be through creation of a video. Um, there's multiple ways that you might decide to communicate this information to others. But for the most part, it all starts off at some part of your brain in these little currents that jump that synapse. So the interesting thing here is we have a lot of different, uh, a, a lot of almost competing elements in this. One is this idea of synaptogenesis, that is healthy formation of new brain cells. Um, newer brain research suggests that our brains are always forming new brain cells all of the time, that we never stop. So there's no, there, there uh, we don't, we no longer have this belief that like an old dog can't learn new tricks. I guess that's the way we say it. Um, but synaptogenesis is just this healthy formation of new brain cells. We continue it throughout our lives and we're always learning and our brain is always growing. But our brain likes to grow with activity. And so what we also see is synaptic pruning. That's a gradual fading away of brain cells. And in a simple way, we can look at it saying, you know, if we don't use parts of our brain, we basically, the brain sort of shuts down operations there. Um, it doesn't quite atrophy, but it sort of shuts down at, it shuts down actions and, and the work there. And it fades away those brain cells. And those connections um, are less strong. And I usually make the joke in class that, you know, I, in my undergrad years, I had a healthy understanding of uh, Simpsons episodes and Hogan's Heroes episodes. And then when I started my doctoral program, all of that information and all of that expertise, that vast warehouse of information has now left my brain and it has been filled in or the, the other areas as a researcher have been, have taken over um, or as an educator have taken over. So I can much more easily talk about uh, brain chemistry or qualitative data analysis than I can um, different Simpsons episodes. So there's a, a positive and a negative to that. So we have this synaptogenesis, healthy formation of new cells, synaptic pruning, which is fading away. And then what we also see is myelination. So myelination, what will happen is, you know, keep in mind we're looking at these electrical currents. There's neurotransmitters jumping that synapse. Well, the more often that we use those connections and create those connections, what will happen is the sheath that leads to that uh, that's part of that synapse and leads to that that jump what that'll do is it will um, insulate it will myelinate so it'll have a fatty coating and what it'll do is it's almost like getting bigger pipes to have more connections coming through so one of the things i usually ask in class is what does this mean for teaching and learning what does this mean when you know that the individuals in front of you they're always healthily forming br new brain cells for the most part um, and you also know that if they're not using aspects or parts of their brain or, or not forming, you know, certain practices in cognition, that's going to prune away or fade away. And what we also know is um, that the more often we use areas, the, the, this, the quicker things get because those, those, that sheath myelinates. So what does this mean for teaching and learning if we look at these different factors um, in teaching and learning and cognition, and then also language development. I think it's also important to talk about culture and the role of culture in language. I don't think that we can uh, eliminate culture from language, and I don't think we can eliminate language from culture. I think they are inexorably connected. Um, so you can think about this, you know, the Spanish language, but then you also have to think about that there's different dialects and different variants of Spanish. You have to think about 
um, the cultural impact or import on the language. You have to think about, um, you know, the food involved in the Spanish language. So all of these things are interconnected. You can't really pull one out and say, oh, this is, you know, I'm just going to take just the language out of the culture and everything else. Um, I don't think that you can do that. One, uh, we need to consider that culture really is a roadmap or like a framework uh, for us to act and interact in the world. It's an inside the head as well as an outside there in the world thing. So it's a little roadmap and it's a way for us to, um, to perceive the outside world. So if we look at this, you know, you consider that you are here in the middle of this and you might want to be successful in this class, but then in our little extending out a little bit from you in our microsystem, we look at your peers in your class and if they're all, um, the, you know, they also want to achieve and they want to be successful in the class, chances are that will make you want to be more successful and you want to achieve as well if you see other people around you also striving. Moving out a little bit to the meso system, we go to the to the neighborhood. We go to your friends and peers. You know, if you if you walk outside of our classroom, you might have a great culture in your classroom. But if you walk outside and you go home and you know you have a bad home environment, or you're living in a a dorm room where your your dorm mate isn't really doing their work, um, if the neighborhood around the school isn't up to you know isn't the best um, that's going to impact you so you might be very positive and want to work well but then as soon as you know this outer system this meso system it, it, it's it's impacting you and your ability or willingness to succeed and then we move out a little bit more and we think about exosystems and we think about other governmental or educational systems religious systems so we think about um, you know is the political landscape is that on your mind? Is the educational system set up for you to succeed? We think about things like the prison to pipeline, uh, school to prison pipeline, and are these things there to help or, or hinder you? Um, but then we move out even more and we'll think about the macro system, your overarching beliefs and values. Um, do you value what you are learning? Um, you know, this is a language and literacy course. Uh, do you consider yourself to be a good reader or writer? Do you consider yourself to be a striving reader or writer? Have you had a, an instructor in the past that um, made you not like writing or not like reading? That's going to impact you and it's going to impact your ability to be successful in this class and, and making sense of this content. Um, and then last but not least, we think about chronotopes and chronosystems and think about dimensions of time and space. Um, you know, just the fact that you are able to read the text and interact with others in a class with your peers. You're able to sit down and watch a YouTube video and, and listen to me lecture and go back uh, again and again and listen to this. What are those different affordances? What are the things that time and space allows you to do right now? As we continue and we move out from that synapse and, and make sense of what uh, Bronfenbrenner is talking about with these cultural or environmental influences, I like to begin or I like to continue with um, thinking about cognitive development and establishing a couple elements um, from Piaget's work. So one of the things that Piaget states is that uh, ideas are developed around logical thinking. So for the most part, our brains like to operate logically, things that make sense generally we agree with and we like to focus on. We also, through uh, this theory of cognitive development, we understand that children think qualitatively differently at different ages. So that goes back to the earlier slide, thinking about how our brains mature over time um, and, and what we can do differently at different ages. That makes sense. We also move in to think about how children are, are for the most part, and also individuals are for the most part, active and motivated learners. And what that means is we learn actively and we learn better when we are motivated. Um, so we learn better when we do things and, and we learn, um, you know, we pay more attention if we are motivated, if we're excited about this, as opposed to you have to learn this, you have to read it because um, I said so. We also understand that children con construct rather than absorb knowledge. And what that means is you're not going to learn any of this content here in this slide just because of my dulcet tones as I lecture. 
you're not going to learn anything. You're not picking up anything here. Um, you need to actively construct and make something from this information. So the, the, um, you know, explicit instruction that we have here, the words that are coming out of my mouth and this slide deck and your readings, they're good, but they build up that background or that base knowledge. But unless you do something with it, um, and that could be a lesson plan or teaching a lesson or I guess writing a paper, but basically doing something with this knowledge really helps you learn. You need to uh, actively construct knowledge as opposed to just sitting there and soaking it up like a sponge. Your brain is not a sponge. And then once again, uh, physical and social environments with others, um, that communication element, that sociological element is essential for cognitive development. It's essential for language development. It's essential for cognitive development. We are social creatures. We learn by interacting and connecting with one another. Continuing this look at cognitive development, there's a couple elements that I believe are very important and they help set my framework for teaching and learning and assessment. Um, and then also I think it's important for us to consider this, at, you know, before we proceed. So children, individuals, but children learn through assimilation and accommodation. So assimilation is basically um, when your brain learns something new, when you are hit by some new content, your brain either assimilates or it accommodates. Assimilates means that it, it takes it in and it puts it over in another area that it already understands. So it, it deals, it, it puts you in a situation, it puts you in an area that is consistent with your schema. Um, and your schema is basically the way that you make sense of the world. So our brains make sense of the world through schema. We tell ourselves stories about the world or we create narratives about the world to try and help us understand why things are the way that they are. So that is schema. Um, and so what will happen is if you learn something new, your brain will say, okay, I, I, I sort of understand what you are and I can relate you to this other area. That's assimilation. But then accommodation is when you learn or interact with some new content that you've never dealt with before. Um, and so your brain doesn't know how to deal with it. So you sort of like put it over in its new area. Um, the way that I uh, talk about this in class is I often relate it to cooking. So if you know how to cook Italian food, um, you know, or, it, you know, let's say you know how to cook ravioli. Um, you might say, okay, I, I know how to make ravioli. I know how to take that, that pasta or that dough put a filling inside, pinch it off, cook it. Um, but there's really, you know, that sort of like dumpling style food, there's uh, multiple variations of that across different cultures. Um, and so you might say, okay, I know how to make ravioli, but then if I go to you and say, do you know how to make an arepa or uh, an empanada or a pierogi? Um, you might say, well, I don't really know those words or know how to make those things. But then if we show you that it's really just another ravioli with different types of dough and different types of fillings, you know the process. So when your brain looks at it, you might say, okay, I can assimilate that information. I can take this pierogi recipe and put it over in the corner of my brain that holds all of the other information about raviolis. So you assimilate. The other side is if you accommodate the information. You basically have no point of reference. And so an example of this is going back to food, you know, if you typically cook Italian dishes and then all of a sudden I say, all right, well, tonight we're going to cook Thai food. We need to break out the wok and the lemongrass and we need to bring out some ginger and, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to start to cook up some noodles and cook up some pho. And you might say, I have no idea how to do with this. Um, you know, I, I can handle a pot and boiling pasta. I can handle a saute pan and getting the sauce ready, but I don't know how to deal with a wok. So, now what the brain's doing is we are accommodating. And so there's two, you know, that there's that gentle tug and pull as we learn new things. We do, for the most part, one or the other. And also, in Piaget's theory of cognitive development, uh, we, we've, we believe that learning generally occurs when cognitive dissonance is present. So cognitive dissonance is the, the idea or the concept of holding two disparate ideas in your head at the same time. Uh, cognitive dissonance is when you expect something to happen, um, but the opposite happens. Um, or if you think about your brain and the way that you assimilate or accommodate, cognitive dissonance is when your schema or your narrative or your understanding of the world is, is situated in one direction, and then you learn something and the complete opposite happens. Well, Piaget is saying that 
true learning occurs when this cognitive dissonance is present. Um, so we have to think about that in teaching and learning and how do I you know, frame teaching and learning for students so that I can create a space for that. Moving on, I want to look at uh, a couple theoretical perspectives. As I said earlier, I think it's important that we know theory and understand theory and uh, use theory to inform teaching and learning and pedagogy. Um, and it's basically just taking time to think through how, uh, what are the ideas behind these theories and how do they impact our work. So I'm going to begin with nativist perspectives. A lot of this is informed by Noam Chomsky and others. And the idea is that for the most part, children are inborn or have innate capabilities for language development. So they sort of have like the roadmap built into their system. Um, and they're born and they say, okay, I had this universal grammar or I had this language acquisition device that has like all of the rules for all of the languages. And so I'm born and I can handle English, French, Spanish, Chinese. And then all of a sudden I'm born into the world and I say, oh, well, there's no other languages here. It's only English. So, you know, what I gradually do is I say, I don't need the other areas. I'm going to fade those out and I'm just going to pick up this English and run with it. Um, and, and that there's this universal grammar or overarching rules for languages. And, and we really focus on the innate or inborn capabilities of the individual as we think about this. So we're thinking about like, you know, in terms of nature and nurture, we're thinking about the, the nature side. Like, what are you born with? What do you come into the world with? And how can we um, exploit those uh, capabilities? So the implications for the classroom, what you want to do is you want to figure out, you know, if this is already baked into the child and they already have this skill set, how do I help them explore language? And so what we do is we look at activating that language acquisition device. We think about read alouds. We think about book sharing. And, and there's also a, a big focus on just getting kids to draw and write. Because the thinking is, if you already have it in you, what are ways that I can, as the teacher, help get those ideas out? Moving along, we also think about, um, we move into, sorry, we move into uh, the cognitive developmental perspectives. We talked about this a little bit before with the work by Piaget. Um, a lot of this says that there's, um, it, it diverges from the earlier nativist perspectives by suggesting that there's no really unique learning mechanism that you come into the, the world hardwired with, but instead language is acquired and we develop these competencies as you mature. And so as you grow, your brain develops and you develop more sophisticated use of language. Um, and, and this pairs up nicely, if you believe in this philosophy, this pairs up nicely with um, a lot of the work in brain development and just thinking through um, how children, how individuals mature over time and what these developments mean. So if we think about what this also means, um, there's a couple key concepts that we have to think about. We often think about, you know, in terms of development, we think about stages. We think about what these stages mean for teaching and learning. Um, and we also think about, um, this is why we talk about, is this instruction developmentally appropriate for learners? And so we start to think about like the sensory motor stage, you know, the initial stage of cognitive development where we're trying to, you know, the, the infant is trying to figure out how the world operates and okay, that's my hand that's waving out there and that's my voice that I hear. Um, and they're starting to make sense of all of these different bits and pieces of the world and, and their role in it. Then we move into ideas of object permanence. Um, and if you've played peekaboo with a child, you see this where um, if, the, if the child, if the infant doesn't see you, then they think that you basically don't exist. So out of sight, out of mind. And then if you pop back into their frame of reference, into their sight, into their field of view, then all of a sudden you've reappeared into the world. Uh, and that's why they sort of give you that shocked look um, when you play peekaboo and they sometimes laugh, sometimes hysterically cry um, because they're, they're shocked, they're surprised. They're like, hey, I didn't know that you were there. Um, where did you go? Where did you come from? Um, then we advance a little bit, we develop and we move into symbolic representation. And that's our use of language and use of symbols and the understanding that I can substitute a, a symbol for language. So that's, okay, I'm, I'm holding up an apple 
you know, or I'm pointing to a picture of an apple if I want an apple. Um, we also see a lot of parents use uh, sign language as a way to symbol. So the the language use is is not fully developed. So we're starting to use symbols in lieu of our use of language um, and communicating with the infant. We also see development of schema or schemata, and, and once again, we've come back to that a couple times. Those are the abstract cognitive structures. So those are those narratives or those stories that we tell ourselves. They're, they're mental constructs. So our, our brain is making sense of the world, and we're developing the schema, um, and so we start to see the individual, the child, start to make sense of the world and, and make up these stories in their head. We move into developmentally pre-operational stage. This is a second stage of cognitive development. This includes um, further abstract thought and representation of the world through uh, pictures, symbols, different perceptions, uh, you know, of things as they interact with them. What this means for the classroom is we want to think about developmentally what is appropriate. So are we in the sensory motor stage? Are we in the pre-operational stage? Is this appropriate for my learners? Um, but generally what we're thinking about is uh, developmentally, where are the students cognitively? What can they do and how am I matching teaching and learning with their developmental level? Um, and then we, you know, we get into leveling of texts, meaning reading level of materials. And, and if there's a reading level of a, of a material that's too difficult for your learners, um, then what are you doing to support them to get to that level so they can understand it? Is it something that they're, they're interacting with that's too easy? And then what are your expectations and how are you scaffolding or, or um, increasing the rigor of that? So we're thinking about matching um, learning with uh, the developmental level. Then we move into, or uh, yeah, I don't want to think of this in terms of a continuum, um, but another perspective is a behaviorist perspective. And a lot of this we, we know through the work of B.F. Skinner. A lot of times in, in educational circles, behaviorist perspectives sort of are frowned upon unless we're in classroom management. And the behaviorist perspective is basically thinking about children or individuals acquiring language and learning through nurture and stimuli around them. So we're thinking about um, you know stimulus and response. We're thinking about condition response. Um, we often get into like Skinner boxes and Pavlovian reactions and most times educators sort of frown upon that because we don't want to think that, you know, children just learn through call and answer or, or learn through response. Um, but behaviorist perspective is really looking at the, the associations between stimulus, response, and events following the response. Um, and so we can, um, you know, think about this in teaching and learning and we can understand that many times language really is taught or learned through imitation and reinforcement. And this might be a, a pre-service teacher uh, sitting in a classroom watching instructors teach and talk and making sense of that. This might be a pre-service teacher sitting with their cooperating teacher and, and sort of learning from them and watching what they do and, and watching what they don't do and watching things they do that they don't agree with and not wanting to do it. We also see, um, you know, Infants and toddlers will watch older siblings or watch their parents talk and interact and imitate them. And it'll be hand gestures and movements um, and, and, you know, the ways in which they pronounce words. And then we see this progress throughout our lives. So a lot of times we do, we learn and we, we process things by assimilating, uh, sorry, by imitating the work of others. So thinking about what this means for our classroom, a couple different things, and these are, you know, pretty simple things to understand. One is we want to focus on the stimulus and response and the reinforcements we use in our classroom. That includes positive reinforcement, that includes repetition and imitation. Um, and what that means generally is uh, thinking about teaching and learning in our classroom and for the most part being uh, positive in our feedback, um, including critical feedback, but then also as we learn through uh, you know, the, the recent research on grit and growth mindsets, sort of reframing failure and, and not viewing it as, as part as primarily a negative piece, but saying, okay, there, there are positives that we can get from this. So we want to think about, 
you know, what these different elements mean um, and how we sort of frame it in our classroom for our learners. We also want to, um, I want to move on to interactionist perspectives. So interactionist perspectives are thinking about how we uh, communicate and learn from the world around us. So, you know, earlier we thought about cognitive development and we, um, we started with nativists and thinking about how we're sort of baked in and, and we come in with this initial roadmap. We move into cognitive development and think about developmentally, how do I pro progress um, and I progress as my brain matures. And then we moved into the behaviors perspectives and thinking about how you interact and imitate and learn from others. So there's a subtle social element to that. The interactions perspective picks up a lot of those different elements and suggests that for the most part, learners acquire language and they develop through attempts to communicate with the world around them. So there's this heavy social, you know, or, or at least there's this heavy focus on communication in the outside world and interacting with the outside world. And then we extend this and we, we include a look at social cultural interactions. So we bring in those social elements and we think about the work by Lev Vygotsky and thinking about zone and proximal development and ZPD, which we'll dig into. And Bruner's look at the language acquisition support system and figuring out what that means as we learn and interact with others. So typically what I do in class is at this point, um, actually, let me, let me wrap up these ideas here. Um, what I usually do is if we think about what this means for our classroom, um, there's a couple different elements thinking about interactionist perspective. Camborn identified seven conditions that, that, um, interact and, and, and are, and are interwoven in our classrooms or in our interactions. Um, because keep in mind that we are always learning. We're learning at home and school in the neighborhood, all the in between spaces. So we want to think about these different conditions or aspects or perspectives of the ways in which we interact. Um, so there could be immersion, um, and that's just, um, you know, we think about language immersion programs where you want to learn Spanish, so I drop you in a Spanish-speaking country. Um, so you are immersed in the content and culture, and that's a very good way to learn. Uh, demonstration is basically, you know, me showing you how to perform a specific skill or me showing you, um, you know, or, or teaching you uh, how to speak a language engaging you is also important an important perspective in this um, and that basically means involving you in the process um, expectations are important because it's it's important to think about what your role in this is and what your role is in this and also what do i expect from you what what do i want to see from you uh, responsibility is an important perspective or element of this um, you want to the learner to understand that they um, bear a certain amount of i'm gonna say the word to to find the word, you bear a certain responsibility in learning or picking up this content. Um, and so if you feel that you are responsible for this, most times people do get more involved and they are motivated. Approximations is where you, you, uh, sort of form some, uh, you know, element of the work and you try to express that work or at least try to employ this. Um, so you're, you're sort of making attempts to or approximating use of this. Employing it is just using it, and then response is the call and response or um, using this for other purposes. What this means for the classroom is that you want to provide a wide range of interactions or a wide range of opportunities for students to get involved cognitively and also develop their language competencies. Typically, in class, what I will do is I'll break people up and we'll get involved into a jigsaw activity. Um, and in this, the understanding is, as I started this slide deck, what I said is that you are active learners and you don't really learn anything just by sitting here and listening. So looking at my clock right now, I've been lecturing for about 32, 33 minutes. Um, and if you were in class at this point, most times people's eyes glaze over. Um, your eyes are probably glazing over in this video now. And so typically what I do is I get people up. Um, in my thinking, every 25, 35 minutes, um, we need to shift gears and do something different. So at this point in my class, what I would do is break you up into four groups. And we would do a jigsaw activity where we would look at the four perspectives that I just talked about. And as I was rolling through all of that information, people's eyes are glazing over. They're not paying attention. And so now what I do is I want you to employ 
um, and teach and engage with this content, exactly what we just talked about with Camborne's conditions. So I break you up into four groups, you study the areas, and we do a jigsaw learning activity where you basically um, pick up one of these strategies, you form a, ho a home group, you study it, you develop teaching materials, you go to an expert group, you teach your materials to your expert group, and you move on. So it's a good way to mix up instruction and have you doing something with it and keeping you moving. Um, and, and this is what would typically happen in our class um, over a whole another 45 minutes. Um, to wrap up this slide deck, what I want to do is look at um, where does language development occur? So we talk about the context and contingencies. Well, what does that mean? What do we mean by these contexts of language development? And the truth of the matter is that you know, as a classroom teacher, you can control for the most part the, the learning and the interactions and those social connections in your classroom. Many times you can't even control it in your classroom, but if you can control it in your classroom, you know, you, you may or may not be able to control it outside of the walls of the classroom, out in the hallways or the broader school campus. Um, and then beyond that, your, your locus of control diminishes. Um, so you have to think about, okay, how much import or impact do I have into the community or home or beyond? Um, but language development and cognitive development happens in all of these areas. And so we have to think about what is the, what's happening in those other areas and, and how can I help mediate this? So there's different patterns of interaction. There's different ways that we develop these language competencies. And also there's different ways that we support cognitive development. One is through eye contact and shared reference points. So that's looking at an individual while you talk to them and, and making them believe that you care what they're talking about. Um, and this is from infancy up through adulthood. We also think about communication loops, about circular sharing, about speaking and listening. Um, we talked a lot about the importance of connections and communications in this work. And, and we see it here in this pattern of interaction. We see the circular sharing and speaking and listening and paying attention um, and sharing. We also think about targeted utterances and, and child-directed speech. And that's um, sometimes as adults, we, we speak out and, and we don't just, you know, many times we don't get down to the level of the infant or the child and let them know that we are speaking directly to them. Sometimes, um, you know, and we see adults doing this to other adults, but a lot of times we don't direct the speech and direct the communication directly to the child. So they understand, oh, you're talking to me. You're not just walking around and just uttering things. Um, and that's important to develop these, these language competencies to see that there is a purpose to your use of language and their use of language. Another pattern of interaction is verbal mapping. Um, and what we're talking about is description or representation. Um, and that's basically mapping out the world. It's, it's sort of like describing and, and providing representations. It's going through the, you know, you'll see in the grocery mark, in the store, in the, in the supermarket, you'll see a, a parent walking and they'll have a, an infant or a toddler or a child and they'll be sitting in the cart and they'll say like apple, banana, watermelon. And, and the parent may or may not be losing their mind, but what they're doing is they're sort of mapping out the world. And they're saying, I'm describing this. Look at apple, red apple, three red apples. I'm putting three red apples in the bag. And so they're showing, they're mapping out the world and showing different representations of the world and describing what they see. And that's helping develop semantic knowledge for the child, for the learner. Another pattern of interaction is questioning, um, and that's the tone of the voice and the way in which I question, and we see the, the cadence and the uh, rising tone or the falling tone to indicate that I'm questioning or I'm demanding something, something um, and these are, are, are a pattern of an interaction that is meaningful in language. It's a lot of the stuff that we don't um, you know, express just through our words. Linguistic scaffolding is supportive dialogue, so that's asking questions and prompting thing and reminding through uh, different terminology what the child should do, what the learner should do. And then mediation is all about simplification. Um, so if you're talking about something and it's very hard to understand, you just really simplify it and drill down. And, and the, the mediation side is, you know, the, the, the teacher or the parent or the 
older sibling or the older peer or the peer will say, well, what are you trying to say here? And helping mediate and get to the root of it. Um, so we, we, we know about mediation from like resolution conflict. So what is somebody else doing in that instance? They're trying to help make sense of it and try and focus. In these various contexts, we want to think about the role of cultural diversity. What are the different elements there? What are their different perspectives? What I've stated here, um, you know, all of these materials, all of these elements and these ideas that I'm presenting, once again, there is theory, there is brain science, but we also have to um, not ignore the role of culture because culture is going to um, drastically impact all of the things that I've already talked about. We also need to think about social routines. A lot of times social routines are, are born into our everyday interactions and our language use. So you might have um, patterns of, ha of, of actions that are informed by language and you have languages that are based solely on the social routine. You might get a social routine that is set that you don't even need to use language. So you might have a certain bedtime where your, your child or the, or child or children know Okay, we, you know, we eat dinner, and then we take a bath, we brush our teeth, we read a book, we go to bed. There's a pattern. You know, I, I enter the classroom, I go get my journal, I sit down, I write my journal for 10 minutes, I put my journal away, I get my materials ready to start class. That's the pattern of the routine that occurs. There's no language involved. There's no language needed. Um, we know the routine and we know the social context and what the expectations are. Um, socioeconomic status is also going to play a role in this. When we think, you know, thinking all the way back to Bronfenbrenner's ecological theory, if we look at this, we want to make sense of what does socioeconomic status mean for this. Um, we think about uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and thinking about if a child comes in and they are hungry, they're not going to really care about a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. If they got in a fight on the on the school bus on the way in, they're not going to care about teaching and learning and, and our use of syllables or phonics or what the theme was in Moby Dick. Um, so we have to think about those different elements and how it's impacting, going back to Bronfenbrenner's ecological theory, how it's impacting their willingness to learn. We have to think about the environment in the classroom, and the environment in the school campus, and also the curriculum. What is the curriculum set up to do? Um, you know, in, in years past, I've taught high school English where the very first reading of the year was a reading that was way above the level of my students. And so right off of the beginning, and this was a departmental mandate. So right at the beginning of the year, a lot of students basically checked out because they're like, I can't read this. This is too hard for me. You know, maybe that's more appropriate for the end of the year. But the, the department decided, hey, we want this to be the first piece of our curriculum entering the year. Um, and, it, and it had a negative impact uh, on the students. Um, and so there's uh, thinking about the curriculum and what role that has. And last but not least, the, the role of the classroom teacher. If you're watching this, if you're paying attention to this, first of all, thank you. Um, but if you're paying attention to this, you have to understand the power that you have and the critical role that you have as an educator in building these competencies, in building and developing uh, these cognitive practices for learners and helping them become uh, influential, valuable, vital citizens of the planet. So once again, it's about 42 minutes. You've got better things to do. I appreciate the time that you sat down and spent uh, listening to me yammer on. Uh, I, I'm terribly interested in this stuff, probably more uh, than, the, than a normal person should be. Um, but by all means, thanks a lot, and uh, hopefully you have a great rest of the day.